through 12. The Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to the Levites, to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send them to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together in this place be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock, and you are our redeemer. Amen. So, appreciate uh, being away last Sunday for the baptism of our grandson, little Jack in Morgantown, and he was a, he was a good little guy. He actually liked that water on his head, and, uh, but it's good to be back today. So, I'm going to ask you a question, and it's okay if you answer in a positive, joyous way. Are you happy that this is the last chapter in the Old Testament? <laughs> yeah, some of you want to applaud. So, we're on this journey, and it's been an interesting journey uh, through all of the stories and the weaving together of the, the messages of the prophets and the kings and the, the amazing journey that God's people went through in this book. And so today, as you heard Alice read the text, it's the final chapter. They've been away in captivity for nearly 70 years. They've come home. They rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the walls. And Nehemiah is the governor and Ezra is the priest. And they bring all the people together in this one market square. And they begin to read to them from the book of the law. And the people begin to weep. Because they realize something. They've been busy building the walls, they've been busy building the temple, they've been busy building their homes, but they hadn't done very little to rebuild their spiritual lives. And when they heard the words of the law, they realized that they were quite far from where God wanted them to be. And they began to weep. Isn't this a beautiful chapter for us to begin the first Sunday of Lent? Because it is a season for us to look within ourselves and see where we are. Whether or not we have places that we need to rebuild and rethink and refocus. And so, uh, Ezra says to them, stop your weeping. It's enough. And may the joy of the Lord be your strength. It was intended to be a day of celebration. After hearing, though, the law explained to the people, they couldn't celebrate. I'm going to ask you a question. Is it possible that while they have worked so hard on all these physical structures and neglected their spiritual structure, their soul and their heart, their hearts are heavy with repentance, there's one lesson that we can learn from this question and that is, just because everything looks good on the outside, doesn't mean it's good in here. You know, we meet people every day, and they put on a good front. And on some days, I'm one of those people, and on some days, you're one of those people. We put on a good front. But inside, what's going on in there? 
Those of you who remember O.J. Simpson, you know, he's had quite a journey. But before he went through all of his trial, before he went through all of his uh, uh, time of serving in prison, and they asked him in an interview one time at the height of his football um, journey if he was uh, happy. And he said, the truth is, I have everything that a human being could ever want, but inside I feel empty. Again, just remember, the people that we see around us, the people that we see on television, the people that we experience in the world may look good on the outside, but it's a matter of what's going on the inside. There are many false appearances in the world today. We must also be reminded that these people here in the text for today heard the law, read and explained. They'd been in captivity for nearly 70 years. This was a whole new generation of people. And they had never heard God's law before. They had never heard the priest explain, Thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal. They had not heard those words. They didn't have anything to base the foundation of how they lived their lives on. And so their response was a response of sadness and sorrow. But it was interesting that Ezra and Nehemiah said to them, okay, that's enough. That's enough. No, no need to be sad any longer. Go from this place. If you truly are repentant, go from this place and start anew. Start to rebuild this part of your life, the spiritual part of your life. It's interesting. He tells them to send portions to those who have nothing provided. You see, there's something about your spiritual life that you can't just fix in a self-centered way. You know, one of the best things you can do when you're feeling sorry for yourself is to go out and do something for somebody else. Have you ever had that experience? Go do something for somebody else and it will greatly uh, change the way you perceive what's going on around you. And so... That's what Ezra and Nehemiah are saying to the people then, and they're saying to us now, go your way. You know what you need to do. It's been a rough transition in your lives and in our nation, but now don't live your life anymore in grief and sadness. Get on with your life and let the joy of knowing that the Lord's going to be with you be your strength. You could say, to a certain extent, that what happened to the people of Israel in this moment was that they fell into a bad mood because of what was going on around them. Now, in this case, they were not living up to God's expectations. But have you ever fallen into a bad mood because somebody in your life and in your circle didn't live up to your expectations? You know, we use these bad moods to punish ourselves and the people around us when things don't turn out the way we wish they had. And so what Ezra and Nehemiah are saying is you feel pretty low, you feel pretty moody right now, you feel pretty bad, but if you go on living that way, it's not going to be much of an existence. You ever known anybody that their whole life was one big bad mood? Huh? Don't point fingers now. We'll all figure it out on our own. We never know what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. We don't. And so that's where we need to have, learn to have empathy for other people and, and realize that, that they may be in a bad mood, they may be depressed, they may be sad, they may be sorrowful, but, but they've, they've got things that they go through that we don't fully understand, and sometimes the best thing we can do for someone is to listen. There was two little boys talking one time, and uh, one of the little boys said to the other one, wouldn't you hate to wear glasses? Wouldn't that be awful to wear glasses? And the other little boy responded, oh, no, no, not if I had the kind of glasses that my grandma wears. She sees how to fix lots of things, and she sees lots of nice things to do on rainy days, and she sees when folks are tired and sorry and what will make them feel better. 
And she always sees what you meant to do, even if you haven't gotten things just right. And I asked her one day how she could see that way all the time. And she said it was the way she had learned to look at things as she grew older. So it just got to be those glasses she's wearing. So how do you look at things? How do you see the world around you? Is it one big, hopeless, sad, sorrowful mess? Or is there the possibility that somewhere deep inside us, there is the potential, in spite of all the sadness and all the sorrow, to have a little bit of joy springing up? Because we know that the Lord is with us. And that no matter what happens, we will get through it. And there are some things that can happen sometimes that can shake us up pretty bad. And no much, matter how much bad news we might get, do we believe that it's still possible to have this joy welling up from within? Husband came home from work one day, told his wife, he said, Honey, this has been a terrible day. And I had so much bad news at work today that I can't take one bit more of bad news. So if there's any bad news to tell me, don't tell me. I don't want to hear it. And she said to him, she says, well, in that case, honey, you'll be glad to know that three out of your four children did not break their arm today. <laughs> Sometimes it's all in how you present it, isn't it? But how do we find joy when it feels like everything else around us is crumbling apart? How do we find joy? Well, we've got to realize that the people who have disappointed us are not the controllers of our emotions and our moods. And I've been one who's done that, and I imagine that all of us in this room have done that. But we've got to realize that we place undue expectations on one another. All of us have done it. And then when that person doesn't live up to that expectation, we fall into this sorrow or joy, joyless mood. God help us to find a way through, to find a way to, to, to believe that even in spite of, of the, the difficulty, that God is with us and that What's past is past, and the future is ahead, and let's go forward in joy and hope and strength with God's help. You know, I want to close my message today by telling you that on uh, page 302 in the story, I just, want to, I just want to mention something on page 302. It was not one of the texts, not a part of the text that Alice read for us today. It's actually where... The story moves now to the final book of the Old Testament, Malachi. And I think after 40 years of pastoring, I never picked up on this before until I read it this week in the story. He says, uh, he says, but he said, the Lord's table can be contemptible. And when you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that wrong? And when you sacrifice a lame or diseased animal, is that wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will... Accept no offering from your hands. That's what Malachi says there on page 302. And for the first time, it dawned on me that what was going on with God's people is they were giving God just a halfway commitment. They were giving God just whatever they had left over at the end of the day. We will never find joy in serving the Lord until we put it all to God. Until we say, okay, God, here's my life, and whatever you want for my life, that's what I want. If we just give God an hour on Sunday 
and forget about him when we walk out of this sanctuary, then maybe like Malachi says, maybe we should just lock the doors because <laughs> we're just playing around. We want to find joy. We've got to get serious about saying, God, you are my God and Savior and Lord, and I will serve you, and I will live for you, and when I falter, I will come to you for forgiveness, and I will try to be a person who believes that the joy of knowing you in every aspect of my life is what's going to be the strength that will carry me through the tough times. And so, God, here I am today, and I'm going to come to your table here in just a minute. I'm going to break the bread, and I'm going to uh, receive the cup, and I'm going to renew during this Lenten season a greater effort on my part to find joy because I know you're with me, and I know I want to serve you with my whole heart, not just part way. And I want you, you alone, to be my God. And so if this is your prayer today, as you come to the Lord's table, offer it up to the Lord and ask Christ in His mercy to guide us into a joy during this Lenten season. It sees everything as it is, through Grandma's glasses and all, and yet believes that God is with us. He's not left us. He's not abandoned us. He's with us, and it will bring us joy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.